can turn now to First Minister questions. It's a, it's a minute early, uh, but uh, I hope members are happy with that. So first question, Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, last summer, exam results showed the higher pass rate had dropped for the fourth year in a row. At the time, John Swinney said, these are a strong set of results. Is that still the government's official position? First Minister. Um, yes, it is. Uh, three quarters of young people uh, passed higher exams. I think that is a good performance. As uh, I have said previously, of course, uh, while exam result performance will fluctuate from year to year, it is important that the Scottish Government assesses uh, the underlying uh, reasons behind that, and that's what we have done uh, here. But as I've also said repeatedly in this chamber, uh, while you have year-on-year -year fluctuations, uh, the long-term trend in Scottish education and in exam passes in particular is one of improvement. So whether we're looking at passes at level five uh, or performance at level six, which is hires, uh, we see more young people leaving school with these qualifications now than was the case when this government took office. And we will continue to press ahead with exactly those improvements. Jackson Cardo. Well, after 13 tricks a year in power, that answer is certainly brave especially when you consider the contents of the report of the Deputy First Minister commissioned into Scotland's education crisis slipped out under cover of darkness at the end of last week. <laughs> in public, praising supposedly strong results, but in private, interested in a detailed analysis of the reported reduction in the A to C rate at higher. In other words, he was alarmed, as were we all, at the plummeting standards in Scotland schools. But it gets worse. The most recent drop in higher pass rates was mostly due to falls in crucial subjects like English, maths and history, which just a few weeks ago, the First Minister asserted to me were improving. So I ask the First Minister again, is it still her position that the falling exam pass rates represent a strong set of results. First Minister. See, uh, if Jackson Carlow thinks 8pm uh, on a Thursday evening is late, that probably says more about his work rate than it does about <laughs> anything to do with this Scottish Government. On the issue of uh, John Swinney's candour, uh, can I... Can I refer Jackson Carlaw to the press release that was issued by the Deputy First Minister uh, on the 6th of August last year, uh, the day the exam results uh, were published, where he says that there has been a fall in the overall pass rate. I don't think uh, that was hiding things, that was being open and transparent. But let's get back to the core issue here of the trend of improvement. Now, Jackson Carlaw uh, called my answer brave. I, I would uh, proffer that the answer actually was accurate. So let's look uh, step by step, level five qualifications, uh, in 06, 07, when this government took office, 71.1% of young people uh, left school with a level five qualification. In the figures published this week for 18, 19, that was 85.1%. Oh. Uh, let's look at higher performance. In uh, 06, 07, uh, the percentage of young people leaving school with a higher it was 41.6%. In the most recent statistics uh, for 2018-19, that was 60.5%. Uh, and as I've said many times in the past, we also have more young people leaving now with at least five passes at higher. Uh, so this government will never shy away uh, from the improvements that need to be made. But if he doesn't want to take uh, my uh, word uh, for the improvements uh, and the strength of Scottish education, perhaps you should pay attention to what, for example, uh, the president of uh, the Association of Directors of Education says. She talks about significant improvement, uh, progress rather, in recent years, or the international experts uh, that advise this government, uh, talking about how impressed they are by the efforts of the government uh, to target inequity and equality. Uh, and in the words of one of them last week, the Scottish education system is doing everything we would expect a high-performing system system to do. That is the reality and we will continue to press forward with those improvements. Jackson Carlo. Well, it's taken a long time, but she has finally followed the habit of her predecessor in patting herself regularly on the back for a performance that everybody else understands is very far from the success she paints it as being. She didn't quote Professor Lindsay Patterson, I know. It's always the selective quotes of people who will cheerlead for her own argument. But it gets worse. Well, I haven't quoted anybody. But it gets worse. Just this month, Mr Swinney told Parliament that the Scottish Government had embarked on reform that was closing the attainment gap and raising standards. However, his own report states exactly the opposite. It says very clearly candidates who are lower attaining are not improving 
at the same rate as higher attaining young people. So again in public saying everything's fine, the gap is closing as the First Minister just did, nothing to see here, when in private months before his own civil servants have told him something categorically different. Does the First Minister really think that her government has been open and transparent with pupils, parents and the public? First Minister. I'm not patting myself or the Deputy First Minister on the back, I'm patting on the back the young people of Scotland yeah. uh, who are delivering improvements. I know Jackson Carlaw wants to talk down uh, the Scottish education system, but he should not be allowed to do so. He talks, he talks about the attainment gap. Let's look at figures published just this week on Tuesday. Uh, the gap between those from the most and least deprived communities in a positive destination is now at a record low. It's less than half what it uh, used to be. Uh, and we go back to the hard facts of this matter. There are more young people leaving school now with qualifications than was the case when this government took office. So despite the best efforts of Jackson Carlaw uh, to berate the achievements of Scottish young people, we will continue to support them, their parents and their teachers, and we will continue to drive forward these improvements in our classrooms. Jackson Carlaw. Pupils, parents and uh, teachers are not patting the First Minister on the back for her performance. And really all this cumulative denial no longer will wash because it's not only as the Cabinet Secretary commissioned a report into a problem he said didn't exist, not only did it contradict what it said, he then refused to publish it until finally it was brought out on a Thursday night when the government knew they could not be held to account in this chamber for yet a further evidence of their failure in government. He obviously hoped no one would notice. And then, and then, when he finally faced the music, he actually had the audacity to say with a straight face to the media, it takes time to improve an education system. First Minister, First Minister, time's up. You've had 13 long years in power, 13 years of failure. How much longer do you and this dreadful government need? First Minister. Annie Wells comes to mind when I look across at Jackson Carlaw. He's clearly angry that people keep voting for the SNP <laughs> in elections. Let's come back to it. It's interesting, isn't it, Presiding Officer, uh, that Jackson Carlaw uh, hasn't been able to argue with any of the statistics I've given him today because those statistics of improvement in our education system are true. So we come back to this nonsense about publishing something, uh, not publishing it, uh, not refusing to publish it, but publishing it at eight o'clock in an evening. John Swinney was on the radio first thing in the morning the day after that. So perhaps Jackson Carlaw wasn't just in his bed at eight o'clock on Thursday night. He wasn't up to hear John Swinney on the radio <laughs> early the next morning either. John Swinney answered a topical question in this very chamber on Tuesday afternoon. And of course, we're standing here in this chamber right now discussing these very issues. The fact that Jackson Carlaw has to talk about all these process issues shows that on the substance, he knows he's in the wrong because Scottish education is improving and we will continue to push forward with these improvements. Jackson Carlaw doesn't like it, but it's in the interest of pupils, the length and breadth of this country. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, last week, I raised with the First Minister the crisis in Scotland's GP and primary care services. This week, Scotland's largest health board, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, suspended all out-of-hours GP services at five centres due to a shortage of doctors. Is the First Minister willing to accept that she bears any responsibility or any accountability for this? First Minister. Well, the, fact, the fact that I am standing here answering questions shows that I believe as it is right and proper that I am accountable and answering uh, questions on these these issues in terms of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde they have announced temporary changes uh, while they uh, have a significant and sustained recruitment campaign uh, it has been made clear to uh, the health board and the health secretary will continue to make it clear uh, that they have a responsibility to ensure uh, improvements and to make sure that their out of hour services meet the varied needs 
of their local population. It is important to note that a full home visiting service is maintained across all of Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, and in addition, of course, transport is made available to those who require it. Uh, so the Health Secretary will continue to work with the Board uh, to ensure that the improvements uh, are made uh, to allow all of these services to operate in the way that patients expect them to do. Richard Leonard. First Minister, these are neither changes nor improvements, they are closures. And only, and only last month, the Cabinet Secretary for Health told a national newspaper, and I quote her, there is a wee plan in place now with Greater Glasgow and Clyde to make that out of hours service more robust. This week, five out of hours services have closed. If this is what happens when the Cabinet Secretary has a wee plan, let's hope she doesn't have any more. Last week, I warned the First Minister that cuts to GP services will hit A&E waiting times. And we know that already. This year, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow, one in three people have waited more than four hours in the Accident and Emergency Department. So we've got GP services under threat, out of hours GP services closing and A&E waiting times going up. The government talks of a whole system approach. Is this how the First Minister defines a whole system approach or is it a whole system failure? First Minister. Firstly, e and &E waiting times are improving and of course they remain the best in the whole of the UK and significantly better than where Labour is in government in Wales. But coming back to... They don't... Well, you know, as I said last week, at the centre of this proposition from Richard Leonard is that the health service in Scotland would be better if Labour were in government. Well, we have proof that that is not the case because where they are in government in Wales, the health service is performing significantly worse uh, than it is in Scotland. But come back to uh, the plans around Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Let me talk uh, about the plan that is in place that uh, Richard Leonard clearly thinks is not important. A significant and sustained recruitment campaign for GPs and advanced nurse practitioners, service remodelling to create multidisciplinary teams, a review of GP pay rates, they will be conducted to ensure they're comparable to other boards, uh, an appropriate appointment system being introduced. These are temporary changes that have been made to allow those improvements to be implemented. In the meantime, home visits are undertaken by GPs, a patient transport service is in place across Glasgow uh, to take uh, patients to out-of-hours services. And of course, lastly, uh, Professor Lewis Ritchie, who led on the national review of out-of-hours services, has agreed to provide support to the board as they improve those services. That's exactly the kind of action we need to see, and the Health uh, Secretary will be holding the board firmly to account on it. Richard Leonard. Uh, these services are not improving, they are closing. And, and, and look, I accept that the First Minister last week may have thought mistakenly that Tobolton was in Wales, but surely that she knows that Glasgow is in Scotland, that Inverclyde Royal Hospital is in Scotland, that Easter House is in Scotland, that Gartnaval is in Scotland, that Greenock is in Scotland, and that the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital is in Scotland. The First Minister talks a lot about financial inputs, but what people are concerned about are patient outcomes. And it's not only in accident and emergency where the government is not meeting its commitments and not keeping its promises. This week, it was confirmed that treatment time guarantees are still being missed as well. In fact, missed 82,000 times last year as many as one in four people not treated in time. So it's not enough for the First Minister to apologise to patients waiting too long, to families anxious and in distress, to NHS staff under-resourced and undervalued and overstretched. It's time the First Minister recognised her accountability, took some responsibility and started meeting finally her own NHS targets. First Minister. Well, let me try and take on all of uh, the different issues that were raised by Richard Leonard in that uh, series of questions. Firstly, on uh, treatment time guarantee, uh, the statistics published this week show an improvement 
in treatment time guarantee performance be, uh, compared to the last quarter. Our accident and emergency performance uh, improved in the last week as well and remains uh, the best in the whole of the UK. Uh, in terms of GPs, um, I know Labour are very sensitive about their performance in Wales and so they should be. Yeah. But in terms of Turbolton, in terms of Turbolton, it should be Richard Leonard who is reflecting in what he said last week. Uh, where he was inaccurate in what he said about the Health Secretary. Um, and the issue in Turbolton is not one of closure, it's one of a change of location, where the same number of GPs will be serving the same number of patients. That is the reality. Uh, we have a number of initiatives underway to make sure we are recruiting more GPs and continuing to deliver uh, excellent health services across the country. And interestingly, uh, neither Richard Leonard or Jackson Carlaw have mentioned today's budget, of course, because they're still trying to work out how they justify voting against it when it delivers everything they asked for. Uh, but on the National Health Service, £15 billion of funding, record funding in our National Health Service, supporting record numbers uh, of people working in our National Health Service and spending in our National Health Service is higher per head of population than in other parts of the UK. That's the record of this SNP government and we'll get on uh, and continue delivering the best National Health Service of any country in the United Kingdom. Thank you. We have a, a number of constituency questions. The first from Liz Smith to be followed by Bob Doris. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. The First Minister will be well aware of the news earlier in the week which revealed that the former NHS Tayside surgeon, Professor Sam El-Jamil, is now practicing in Libya, and of the very considerable ongoing distress that this is causing to his former patients in Scotland, who've already been waiting for two years to find out if there will be a criminal prosecution following the alleged malpractice in Scotland. Now, I know that the First Minister cannot comment on ongoing police inquiries, but can I ask her what her Scottish Government can do to offer Professor El-Jamil's patients in Scotland who have been so badly traumatised by this, some support. First Minister. Uh, well, I, I share Liz Smith's concern about the report we read earlier in the week. In terms of support for uh, patients of the surgeon, if there is any support the Scottish Government can give, uh, then we are more than happy to consider that. And if uh, there are constituents of Liz Smith uh, who want to be in touch with us, then uh, we'd be happy uh, to make that contact. In terms of the surgeon's ability to practice, of course, I, I can't uh, comment on ongoing police investigations. Uh, however, Liz Smith will also be aware uh, whether or not uh, a surgeon remains able to practice is a matter for the General Medical Council, uh, not for the Scottish Government. It is not something uh, we have power over. But uh, suffice to say, uh, I do understand and share the concerns that have been raised um, and certainly want to be in a position to offer whatever support we can to patients affected. Bob Doris, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. First Minister, I have been contacted by women who are suffering due to a UK-wide shortage of HRT. Here's what one woman told me just this morning. Stopping medication abruptly can have all kinds of negative effects. Until there's a re-established supply, it feels as though you, are just, you just have to wait, feeling less than yourself until it becomes resolved. All the issues you're trying to combat, sweats, mood swings, etc., come back. There must be women struggling day to day, possibly in silence, as they feel they cannot turn to their employer. First Minister, I will be writing to Matt Hancock, the UK Secretary of State, uh, outlining the blight caused to women's lives in my constituency that I represent, to ask him what he can do to tackle this shortage. We surely have a common cause across the UK in relation to this matter. How can the Scottish Government assist? First Minister. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, um, I know that many women will have very real concerns about uh, shortages of HRT. Uh, as Bob Doris rightly says, the implications of that for many women uh, can be and will be severe. Many women uh, will suffer very debilitating uh, symptoms. Um, and as Bob Doris rightly says, many will suffer in silence. It is an unacceptable situation and one that people are rightly concerned about. Uh, the supply of medicines, of course, is reserved to the UK government. We continue to press them to work very closely with the affected companies to resolve the issue as quickly as possible. Uh, last month, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for Scotland wrote to all NHS boards, GPs and community pharmacists to advise them about the latest supply position and to provide advice about appropriate HRT products for patients who are affected by the supply issues. Any disruptions in the availability of drugs, including uh, HRT, will be concerning uh, to those who have been prescribed them and anybody affected by the disruption should discuss alternative treatment options with their doctor in the first instance. Thank you. Jackie Bailey, be followed by Mark McDonald. Jackie Bailey. 
NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde announced the complete suspension of out-of-hours services in Inverclyde and the effective closure at sites across Glasgow and in my own constituency at the Vale of Leven Hospital. This most basic of emergency services will no longer operate between 5 p.m. to midnight or at weekends, forcing my constituents to travel for more than 20 miles to get to an A&E service. This will simply add to the waiting times at A&E instead of treating people locally. And can I say to the First Minister, temporary is 18 months to two years. The report from Sir Lewis Ritchie was five years ago. The Health Board have had years to sort this problem out, but have instead stuck their head in the sand and done nothing. Will the First Minister instruct the Health Board to reverse this decision, agree that the Health Secretary will meet with me and with local campaigners who are devastated by this action, and while she's at it, sack the Chair and Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde for gross incompetence? First Minister. Well, in, terms, in terms of the Health Board, Jackie Bailey will be aware that it is partly a uh, concern about out of hours performance that led the Health Secretary to elevate the board to uh, level four of uh, the monitoring regime. Um, I'm advised by the Health Secretary she has asked uh, Callum Campbell, who's been appointed by the Scottish Government as its turnaround director, to meet with and speak to Jackie Bailey about the, the local issues uh, in her constituency. And if that uh, contact hasn't been made yet, it will be made uh, shortly. These are temporary changes, uh, but we want to see the Health Board uh, prioritising improvements to the services at the Vale of Leven and and in Verclyde, we do see that as uh, a priority and we will be working closely uh, with the board as they take forward the other improvements that they are required to make. Thank you. Mark MacDonald, to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In November 2014, Clydesdale Bank trumpeted investment in and refurbishment of their branch in Dice in my constituency. Uh, yesterday, they announced the plans to close that branch in September of this year. This follows the closure of the village's RBS and a significant reduction in the opening hours of the village's TSB. Does the First Minister share my concern at the approach being taken, which will be detrimental to my constituents and local businesses? And while this is ultimately a commercial decision, will the Scottish Government do what it can to raise this matter and seek to convince Mer Virgin Money, who own Clydesdale, to think again? First Minister. Uh, well, I do understand these concerns. Uh, closures of bank branches uh, cause understandable concerns, particularly in uh, more rural communities. And uh, this is an issue that we discuss regularly uh, with different banks and will continue to do so. Um, I'm sure uh, Fiona Hislop, the new economy secretary, would be happy to discuss the issue uh, further with Mark McDonnell and uh, raise it again uh, with banks generally and uh, with Clydesdale Bank in particular. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the Accounts Commission is seriously concerned regarding the slow progress of Fife's integrated joint board and anticipates another overspend in excess of £10 million this year. These significant financial pressures are putting health and social care services at risk. What urgent action will the Scottish Government take to ensure clear financial sustainability issues are addressed? First Minister. Uh, well, these are issues uh, that are under discussion. I know the Health Secretary has had very recent discussions about this, and indeed part uh, of the local government settlement that involves social care in the budget has at its heart the need to address issues like this in Fife uh, as well uh, as more generally. And I'm sure the Health Secretary would be happy to uh, send a progress and an update report to the member uh, in due course. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I first welcome the decision to reject the Cool Links development? It seems that some lessons may have been learned since Donald Trump was allowed to trash the many estate. But there remain big questions over Trump's business dealings in Scotland. The purchase of many and the Turnberry Golf Resort were part of Trump's huge cash spending spree in the midst of a global financial crisis, while his son was bragging about money pouring in from Russia. The US House of Representatives has heard testimony which states, we saw patterns of buying and selling that we thought were suggestive of money laundering. And the testimony goes on to express particular concern about the golf courses in Scotland and Ireland. Is the First Minister aware that nearly a year ago, the campaigning organization Avaz sent her a briefing setting out these concerns in great detail and proposing action which is within the power of the Scottish government? They've heard nothing back since last summer. Can the First Minister tell us what action has been taken since this report was received? 
First Minister. Uh, no, I, I can't do that today. I'm happy to go back and uh, look at that correspondence and come back to Patrick Harvey in detail. Um, I think most people here would uh, recognise that I am uh, no defender of Donald Trump, of his politics or uh, any of his other dealings. Uh, but where there are concerns, um, as I, I think I hear Patrick Harvey say about uh, alleged uh, criminality, these are matters in Scotland for the police and for the Crown Office to investigate. They would not be matters for me to investigate and I hope members across the chamber would understand uh, and respect uh, the very good reasons for that. But in terms of the specific uh, correspondence, I will certainly uh, check back through my office uh, to see uh, what happened after that was received and what action, if any, uh, was taken. And I'll come back to Patrick Harvey on that as quickly as possible. Patrick Harvey. The First Minister is right that criminality in Scotland would be a matter for the, the law officers and prosecutors, but there are also questions here for Scottish ministers uh, leading the Scottish Government. Under the, the Criminal Finances Act, it has powers that are designed for just this kind of situation. Trump's known sources of income don't explain where the money came from for these huge cash transactions. There are reasonable grounds for suspecting that his lawfully obtained income was insufficient. Trump is a politically exposed person in terms of the law, and there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that he or people he's connected with have been involved in serious crime. Some of them pleaded guilty. Scottish ministers can apply via the Court of Session for an unexplained wealth order, a tool designed for precisely these kind of situations. We need to be given confidence that the government will show leadership and use the powers available to them. Will the First Minister seek an unexplained wealth order and make it clear that Scotland is not a country where anyone with the money can buy whatever land and property they want, no questions asked? First Minister. Well, certainly Scotland is not uh, that kind of country and should never be that kind of country. Look, I, I say in all seriousness to Patrick Harvey, he is raising serious issues. I, I don't want to give him answers without the full information in front of me. So I am undertaking to come back with, to him uh, after I've had the chance to look into this in more detail. Obviously, as I've said, and as Patrick Harvey has accepted, issues of alleged criminality would not be for me to investigate. Uh, but beyond that, and I'm not talking uh, about the specifics here because it would be wrong for me to do so without having properly uh, looked at this. But in general terms, uh, where the Scottish Government was taking legal action uh, of any nature, it may also uh, be inappropriate or certainly ill-advised for me to talk about that uh, in this chamber in detail as well. So if uh, any action in any uh, subject uh, is a matter uh, for legal proceedings, uh, then there's a lot of sensitivity uh, and uh, respect for due process that has to be attached to that. But I, I do take the question seriously. Uh, I will look into the correspondence uh, that Patrick Harvey has referred uh, to today, and I will come back to Patrick Harvey as soon as possible uh, with as full an answer as I'm possible to give, with all of the caveats that I hope he understands I've uh, injected into this answer so far today. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, two hours ago, the Court of Appeal ruled against the third runway at Heathrow. I asked the First Minister about her support for Heathrow last May, but she was standing firm. I asked her again this January, and she refused to budge. Is the First Minister glad a court has stopped Heathrow expansion? First Minister. I actually think... Uh, Willie Rennie mischaracterises uh, my answers to him. Uh, the decision on whether or not there is a, a third runway at Heathrow is not one for uh, me or for my government. In fact, I think I pointed out to him that the last time this came to a vote in the House of Commons, uh, SNP MPs did not uh, vote in favour of that. Uh, I understand uh, the court has ruled in the way that Willie Rennie says this morning. I've not had uh, the opportunity uh, to look at the reasons uh, behind that ruling, but I want to see all government policies, both Scottish government policies and Westminster government policies, uh, aligning with our climate change ambitions. And in Scotland's case, the need to get to a net zero position uh, by 2045. And uh, I think increasingly uh, questions have been, and understandably and rightly are being raised, um, about whether or not uh, expanding Heathrow in that way would align with that climate change uh, responsibility. So um, I hope that is clear to Willie Rennie. I'm not sure how I can uh, make my position any clearer. Um, and as far as the court is concerned, uh, these are always uh, matters for the courts. Willie Rennie. Well, I'm afraid all that waffle won't tackle climate change. The, the court found that the UK government had failed to carry out an environmental assessment on its Paris climate change commitments. The Scottish Government made exactly the same mistake 
when it signed the Memorandum of Understanding on Heathrow. Our parliamentary questions found that no climate change assessment was made by Scottish ministers. They missed 600,000 tonnes of emissions. But the First Minister told us not to worry, as the Tories were taking care of the environmental side of things. That looks pretty stupid today. So will the First Minister confirm that she is finally ripping up her agreement in support of Heathrow expansion? First Minister. Well, I don't know how to make this clearer to Willie Rennie that the decision on Heathrow expansion is not for the Scottish Government. It is not within our power or areas of responsibility. Uh, what we did say was that if that was going ahead, and I, I, I would hope Willie Rennie uh, would understand this, then any economic benefit of that uh, should not miss out uh, Scotland. And in terms of our climate change ambitions, unlike the UK government, of course, uh, we include emissions from aviation in the calculation of our emissions overall. Um, and again, I, I think Willie Rennie should be aware of this, because I'm sure I've pointed it out in the chamber previously. We are in the process right now, the latter stages of the process of updating our climate climate change action plan which will be published in April so we are looking right across government at all of our policies to make sure well uh, we, I'm, I'm being heckled uh, from Mike Rumbles who says actions not words the climate change action plan is all about actions to meet our world leading our world leading targets and it's actually what this parliament demanded we do so can i suggest willie rennie instead of getting up and calling for things that are out with the powers of this government actually puts his shoulder to the wheel and looks at the actions this government and this parliament and this country has to take because that's exactly what my government is doing so a lot of constituency questions if we can get through some of them annie wells to be followed by anas sarwar annie wells thank you presiding officer First Minister Anne-Marie Ward of Drug Death Action Group Favour UK said this about yesterday's drug summit. It was nothing more than a part of political broadcast for the SNP and no one in the Scottish Government is willing to take responsibility for what's under their control. As well as being in recovery for decades, Anne-Marie is also a member of your party, First Minister. She's going to another funeral of a friend who died from drugs on Monday. And she's asking why this government keeps blaming Westminster when it has the powers to fund rehab beds now. Will the First Minister put politics aside and back the cross-party calls for 15.4 million to residential rehab? First Minister. Well, can I say, I, I will listen carefully to all those with lived experience, including Anne-Marie Ward. I think her views deserve to be uh, treated absolutely seriously, just like the views of anybody. But I do think... Uh, for Annie Wells to say that about the summit yesterday does uh, all of the people who contributed to that summit um, a real disservice um, because that summit discussed important issues, it discussed issues important to people with lived experience um, and it discussed changes in the law that are uh, required. Uh, the task force reported on its recommendations and uh, there were a, a range of initiatives uh, and suggestions uh, raised yesterday that uh, hopefully will feed into the UK government summit that is being held today. Uh, let me say two, two other points on, on funding. Um, the draft budget that was published a few weeks ago uh, included an increase in uh, funding for reducing harm, uh, harms related to drugs, uh, increased funding of 12.7 million. Uh, I can confirm today that the Finance Secretary will confirm this afternoon that we intend to go further than that. Instead of an additional 12.7 million, there will be an additional 20 million pounds of funding from health uh, dedicated to reducing harms from drugs. Uh, and that will support that will support the recommendations that the task force uh, brings forward. So we are very, very serious about uh, this and we are serious in working with anybody and everybody to tackle uh, what is uh, a public health emergency. Uh, but on the issue of UK government action, uh, we absolutely recognise the responsibility in us and the range of actions that we are taking, the funding uh, we are dedicating to this uh, shows that. But it is the case that there was a lot of consensus yesterday uh, that law changes are needed as well, uh, including around a safe consumption room, um, and that does lie with the UK government. So I absolutely take my responsibility. I just wish we had uh, a similar approach from the UK government so that we could genuinely put party politics aside on this and work together in the interests of those who need us to do exactly that.
And that's Sarwar. He started screaming in my face that I should go home, that I was a terrorist. Again, he used the P word, swearing at me, telling me I wasn't welcome here. The words of Lindsay Taylor, a Scots-born Muslim who wears a hijab. She goes on to say, I don't use public transport. I don't walk about streets I'm unaware of. It has altered my behavior. The initial findings of our public inquiry into Islamophobia will shock the majority of Scots, but sadly not surprise Scottish Muslims. It found a third of Muslims saying Islamophobia is an everyday issue. 80% have experienced Islamophobia and 80% believe it is getting worse. This impacts education, policing, communities, transport and employability. First Minister, will you commit that all relevant Scottish Government departments will make themselves available to support the work of the inquiry? Because I know there are lots of issues that divide people in this chamber and indeed in our country. But the fight against all forms of prejudice and hatred is one fight that I know that must unite us all. First Minister. Um, yeah, yes, I will give that commitment uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government uh, that uh, the Scottish Government uh, and its agencies will make uh, ourselves available to cooperate with uh, this inquiry. Um, the findings coming out of this inquiry, as Anna Sarwar said, will shock many people, uh, but unfortunately uh, they do not shock Muslims and I'm sad to say they do not entirely shock me either because I regularly hear from uh, Muslim friends and constituents of mine uh, the completely unacceptable heinous uh, abuse that they are the victims of almost on a daily basis. It is unacceptable, it shames our country and whatever else uh, we may disagree on, whatever else we may divide on, we must unite uh, to stamp this out. Uh, that bigotry, racism, prejudice, uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, prejudice of any uh, shape or form or nature is completely unacceptable. It is not who we are. Uh, we must never tolerate it and we must come together uh, to make sure uh, that it can be eradicated once and for all. Thank you. Question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what the economic impact has been this year of flooding. Minister. Uh, there's no doubt that the impact of flooding can be significant. When flooding occurs, communities, businesses and infrastructure suffer with the economic impact depending on the location, source, extent and duration of flooding. Uh, there are, of course, other significant consequences which, although not economic, are very important, including the stress and anxiety of those affected and, of course, travel disruption. Uh, managing flood risk is a priority for the government. We invest a minimum of £42 million in flood protection measures each year, as well as supporting SEPA's flood forecasting service and the Scottish Flood Forum. We're also aware of the threat of increased flooding posed by climate change, and that's why we're leading the way in the transition to net zero. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank the First Minister for that reply. Uh, last weekend, the A8 uh, trunk road from Lang Bank into Inverclyde was closed due to flooding with reports of people sleeping in their vehicles overnight. And this is in addition to the usual flood areas that are to actually take place in my constituency. Whilst the constituents uh, may have been able to use a back road to get in into Inverclyde, visitors to the area as well as drivers delivering goods to businesses will have struggled to reach my constituency at the weekend. Will the First Minister support my calls for improvements to the current roads and flood prevention infrastructure, as well as a feasibility study into a bypass as solutions to improving the economic opportunity, as well as the health needs of my constituency? First Minister. Uh, well, the second strategic transport project review is now well underway and it is considering improvements to the transport network across Scotland, uh, including, uh, I can say today, the A8 in the members' constituency. Uh, the review will appraise a range of potential interventions, including any upgrades to the A8 through Inverclyde, and that will ensure that our transport investment plans remain relevant to delivering uh, the outcomes of the new national transport strategy and continue to be the correct decisions for the public purse. The cause of surface water flooding can often be a complex interaction of many sources of flooding and I understand that Scottish Water and Inverclyde Council are currently working together to consider the best way of tackling flood issues within Inverclyde. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government considers to be the educational benefits of learning to play music. First Minister. Music education provides significant benefits to children and young people. It gives them opportunities to be creative and it also contributes greatly to their mental, emotional, social and physical well-being. It's for that reason that the expressive arts, which includes music, is one of the eight core areas of the curriculum in Scotland. 
It is for local authorities to decide how to provide music education depending on local circumstances, priorities and traditions. In taking those decisions, local authorities should consider the undoubted benefits that learning a musical instrument can have on well-being and attainment. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? But I don't know how you can reconcile your answer with the fact that the government refuses to class music tuition as core to the curriculum. In council areas who are now charging for music tuition, and that's 26 out of the 32 councils, uptake of music tuition has plummeted by as much as 45%. So like sport and art and drama, access to music tuition is increasingly only available to those who can afford it. First Minister, you never miss an opportunity to clear your desire to tackle inequality, but surely you must recognise that persisting with these types of policies, you're reducing opportunities for our children to participate and excel, and you're actually driving inequality. I would urge members not to use the term, well, urge members not to use the term you, just refer to the, prime, the First Minister by our title. First I Minister. It's more polite than the Tories uh, usually are, but we'll let that one go. Um, on the, on a, an issue of fact, uh, in terms of the broad general education in Scotland, pupils are entitled uh, to music as one of the core, uh, eight core parts of the curriculum. Um, secondly, um, I have made it clear, the Deputy First Minister has made it clear in the past that we are concerned by uh, moves by any local authority to limit access to instrumental music uh, tuition. All local authorities should consider the Education Committee's recommendations that music tuition should be provided free of charge. Of course, uh, we have the budget this afternoon. We were, we're already providing a fair deal for local authorities, but of course, uh, as a result of the deal announced yesterday, there will be an additional £95 million going to local authorities uh, for resource spending, which should make it easier for those local authorities who are struggling to keep music tuition free. Now, I would say that the Conservatives specifically asked us to put £95 million extra into the revenue budgets of local government. So perhaps the question for the Tories today is, given that we have now done so, will they back uh, that budget or will they vote against the money uh, that is needed for the very things that they stand up in this chamber and demand, including music education? And Willie Coffey. Thank you. Does the First Minister recognise the positive influence that two successful rock bands from Kilmarnock, namely Biffy Clyro and Father Son, are having on young people in my constituency and elsewhere, opening up for those young people the prospect of successful careers in the world of music, which is well provided for in East Ayrshire. Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, as, as an Ayrshire uh, girl, I'm always delighted to celebrate success from Ayrshire, uh, including Kilmarnock, and uh, both of these bands uh, that Willie Coffey references are, are excellent uh, and inspirational. Um, but I, I do think uh, they also illustrate the importance of giving young people access to music. That's why I think it's very important. That's why it has the place it does have in the curriculum. And that's why, of course, uh, we're providing the resources to local authorities to make sure that they can provide uh, music tuition to young people free of charge, which I think they should all do. Sarah Boyack, question number seven, Sarah Boyack. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Cosler's statement that the draft budget proposals put the 2030 child poverty target at risk. Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I would say that that response came before yesterday's announcement that £95 million extra was going uh, to local government. Uh, in addition, this year we will introduce the Scottish Child Payment uh, for eligible under sixes, which around 140,000 families will be eligible for. The budget also commits £843 million for affordable housing, £645 million for the expansion of early learning, £182 million for tackling the poverty-related attainment gap in schools, and £3.4 billion for social security. Uh, local government will receive additional revenue funding of £589.4 million uh, alongside the ability to raise the council tax. Councils now have the potential to access an additional £724.4 million, which is a real terms increase of 5.3%. So actually, the Scottish budget will help us in our efforts to tackle child poverty, and I hope the member and her party accordingly will back these budget proposals this afternoon. Sarah Boyack. If the First Minister had actually looked at the demands for fair funding for our services, she will know that there will be cuts to essential services following this year's budget. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation have also said the budget falls short of the mark in tackling child poverty. 
The Poverty Alliance has also called for increased investment in the Scottish Welfare Fund because crisis grants are a vital lifeline for families. I know this is difficult for SNP members. Crisis grants are a vital lifeline for families who are struggling to get by, but councils need proper funding to cope with the increased demand that COSLA made representations to the government about. First Minister, will you listen not just to us, but to other organisations in order to wipe out child poverty across Scotland and to give our young people a chance for the future? First Minister. Well, of course, a bit like the Tories, uh, Labour asked us to put additional money into local government. We have said we are putting additional money into local government. It was uh, the amount that they seemed to want us to do, but of course now uh, they're trying to justify voting against it. But I don't think... Anybody uh, who cares about uh, tackling poverty and tackling child poverty uh, in particular could in good conscience vote against this budget this afternoon because it includes the funding for the Scottish yeah. child payment, yeah. uh, which will in the first phase of it uh, deliver extra income to 140,000 families, something that Richard Leonard uh, used to ask me to do but hasn't mentioned since we agreed to do it, strangely enough. It includes more money for affordable housing, uh, more money for early learning and childcare, uh, money for tackling the poverty-related attainment gap in schools, uh, and real terms increase in the funding available to local government. If Labour vote against this budget this afternoon, they put all of that at risk, including uh, much of uh, what we will be investing in social security. And it will be them, uh, in these circumstances, that will have to explain why they are prepared to put the fight against child poverty at risk. I'm sure they don't want to be in that difficult position. Thank you very much, and we'll return to that subject later. Uh, that concludes. Oh, point of order. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. On an earlier answer to uh, Richard Leonard, uh, the First Minister stated that to Bolton GP surgery is not closing, it's just moving. It's actually moving to Moss Blown, uh, um, uh, the Presiding Officer, which is definitely not in to Bolton. So oh. that is an inaccuracy. The, t the GP surgery in to Bolton is closing, and I would like to have that on the record, please. Thank you. I note the point that uh, Mr Whittle makes. It is a point of clarification rather than a point of order for me to adjudicate on, but that point has been made. Uh, and that will conclude First Minister's questions. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Tom Arthur, but I'm going to have a short suspension just to allow members, ministers and the public gallery uh, to change seats. So a short suspension. <laughs>